Anyone here doesn't know, I am not Dr. Kirk Youngblood. <laughs> I'm Tim Morris, and this is the last Sunday of the month, and so we are returning tonight to our uh, a lesson for our video series on the Puritans, as we have been doing throughout the year. And so far in this series, we have looked at the lives of several English Puritans. We've looked at Richard Sibbs, Thomas Goodwin, Richard Baxter, and John Bunyan. And last month, Pastor Kirk uh, talked about several of the American Puritans. And tonight, we're going to go back to 17th century England and look at the life of Matthew Henry. So uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time we have together. And thank you for godly men and women in the history of the church who are great examples to us of faithful Christian living. And we pray that as we look at the life of your servant, Matthew Henry, tonight, that you would be glorified. We pray that this would be profitable for us and uh, that uh, all that we do and say would bring honor to your name. And we ask that in Christ's name. Amen. Well, before we go to the video, I'd just like to uh, have us recall for a moment who the Puritans were and uh, why we should be concerned about spending time studying them anyway. Uh, I'll just remind us briefly that the, the word Puritans uh, was first used in the 1560s to describe English Protestants who didn't think the Reformation in England went far enough and it was still incomplete. And they got this name because they wanted further purification of the church in England. And uh, the term was really intended as an insult, but it came to be embraced as a positive description of the reform movement that they wanted to bring to the Church of England, to bring it into greater conformity with the Word of God and particularly with the reformed doctrines of grace. And the Puritans were all about the authority of the scripture, sound doctrine, love for Christ, perseverance in suffering, and an eternal perspective in the here and now. And it's these characteristics of Puritan thought and uh, of the things that they wrote that we still have that make them relevant and uh, profitable for us to study today. And so now tonight we're going to look at the life of Matthew Henry, who is of course best known for his six volume commentary on the whole Bible. And so now we'll go to the video. It's about 20 minutes and then I'll come right back. If you would ask the average reading church member who has some awareness of Puritan history and theology for the name of an English Puritan, I think that probably, maybe alongside John Owen, uh, the first name that would be mentioned would be Matthew Henry. Uh, even today in the 21st century, uh, many evangelical believers have uh, copies of Matthew Henry's commentaries in their homes. It's still a uh, found really as a, a staple uh, among classic reformed literature commentaries on the Bible. Well, in our session together, I want to step uh, with you to uh, look back at the history of the life of Matthew Henry briefly and look at some of his work, his writings, what we can gain from them. Well, Matthew Henry was born in 1662. He was the second son of uh, Philip and Catherine Henry. His father was a capable and godly dissenting minister in the Presbyterian uh, stream of English Puritanism. His mother was recorded as being a cheerful, content, and holy woman. And so as a child, Matthew Henry had the blessing of growing up in a Christian home in a covenant household. 
Well, as an infant already, he nearly died as of an illness that took his older brother John's life. And so he grew up in a family that knew its share of grief and suffering. Uh, young Matthew learned how to read at a very young age, in part a testament to the passion for biblical literacy at the time. One biography says that Matthew Henry was able to read the Bible with distinctness and make observation at the age of three years old. Now, whether or not that's the case, and we don't want to wander into creating an English Puritan hagiography, it is clear that through his schooling, uh, Matthew developed and displayed God-given gifts that would uh, later bear tremendous fruit. It was around the age of 10 that the young Matthew Henry became seriously sick. Uh, he was believed to be near death. And uh, while we don't know the impact this had on him at that particular moment during his illness, we do know three years later, in October of 1675, now 13 years old, Matthew Henry penned a personal journal entry listing God's mercies to him in the past few years since around the time of that serious illness. And this, uh, this journal entry is just amazing. It's wonderful uh, to read these words from a young teenager. He opens by thanking and praising God for the Lord Jesus Christ. His incarnation, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and intercession, he thanks God for grace, for pardon, for peace, for the word, the means of grace, for prayer, for the good that he's received under preaching, for help from God under temptation, and he thanks God that God has broken his heart over his sin. He goes on to say, Lord Jesus, I bless you for your word, for good parents, for good education, and that I was taken into covenants as an infant in baptism. And Lord, I give you thanks that I am yours and will be yours. Goes on to say, I think it was three years ago that I began to be convinced hearing a sermon by my father on Psalm 51, verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. I think it was that that melted my heart, and afterwards I began to pursue Christ. He says, he goes on to say this at the age of 13, if never I came to Christ before, I do it now, for I take God in Christ to be mine. I give myself to be his in the bond of the everlasting covenants. As far as I know my own heart, I love God in sincerity. I really believe I'm forgiven for Christ's sake. I love the people of God. I love the word of God. What a testimony from a 13-year-old. And from his journals, as, as we read these things that he penned at this age, many biographers conclude that already at this young age in life, Matthew Henry was beginning to show a love for ministry, a love for the Word, love for the people of God. Now, he was an eager student of the Word. He was grateful for the work of ministers through his teenage years, took careful notes, and was happy to, to discuss the Word as he heard it and as it was preached to him. We know by the age, uh, sorry, by the year, 1680, Matthew Henry had already been directed by his father now to study theology as well as other subjects under a dissenting minister named Thomas Doolittle. Now remember this is uh, during the window of Charles II, so the window of uh, persecution, the ejection of the Puritans has occurred from their pulpits, the English Puritans, those who would not conform uh, to the system of uh, ritual and worship uh, being imposed under Charles II. And Matthew Henry's family, as Puritan-minded, or Presbyterian-minded Puritans, uh, fell under this category. And so, to get theological training, uh, Matthew Henry uh, couldn't really enter uh, the great schools like Cambridge or Oxford. And so, instead, he goes into a, really a private tutoring s uh, situation, a small academy, under a dissenting minister named Thomas Doolittle. Not long after his arrival there, one of his close friends, one of his best friends, his cousin Robert, dies of illness, bringing a new sudden grief into his life. 
same time, God is providing friends and relationships. And Henry continues to reflect on his blessings in these years of life. He also continues to grow in a relationship with his sisters. He regularly writes, writes to them and loves visiting his family. Two years after beginning his studies here, he pens in his journal another list of thanksgiving titled, Mercies Received. And what does he say here? Listen to some of these things. They're, they're great to read. I am thankful for God's mercies received that I'm endued with a rational, immortal soul, capable of serving God here and enjoying him in the future life, and was not made as beasts that perish. I've had a great measure of health, and when I've been visited with sickness, health has been restored to me. When a dear brother and companion has been taken away at the same time, by the same sickness, I'm grateful that I'm blessed with such parents as few have and sisters that I rejoice in. I am thankful for God's mercies that I've had an education, the knowledge of languages, arts, and sciences, and through God's blessings on my studies have made some progress in them. I'm thankful for God's mercies that I've been born in a place and time of gospel light, that I have the scriptures and means to understand them by daily expositions and good books. I'm thankful that by God's mercies, I have a heart to give myself to and delight in the study of them. I'm thankful that in infancy, I was brought into the visible church in my baptism, that I've had a religious education, that the principles of religion have been instilled in me with my very milk. From a child, I've been taught the knowledge of God. I'm thankful that God has inclined my heart to devote myself to him and the service of his church in the work of ministry, if he shall ever please to use me. And that I've had so many sweet and precious opportunities and means of grace, Sabbath sermons, sacraments, and have enjoyed not only the ordinances themselves, but communion with God. I have had some sight of the majesty of God, the sweetness of Christ, the evil of sin, the worth of my soul, the vanity of the world, and the reality and weight of invisible things. Well, knowing that becoming a ministry minister of a congregation of the Church of England was, humanly speaking, impossible, and uh, by conviction, uh, also inaccessible, that dissenting groups were small and harassed, and Matthew Henry, as he completes his initial academy studies, decides to pursue the study of law. And it really has in mind, it seems, uh, the thought that he could become a lawyer and perhaps serve bivocationally in ministry. And so this is what he does as he pursues the study of law. Opportunities for preaching begin to arise. And within a few years, his, his gifts in preaching are increasingly recognized. And a group of ministers, really a, a provisional, or you could say underground church, a presbytery, meets together in London. They examine him for gospel ministry. And in 1687, he's ordained at the house of a man named Richard Steele. The same year, he marries a young woman named Catherine Hardware. And he goes back now to the town of Chester, where he begins his ministry. Now remember, this is a dissenting ministry. This is outside of the Church of England, the Anglican Church. And congregation uh, soon grows to around 250 people. And this is about the size that his congregation will be and stay at uh, through his ministry. And as he engages pastoral ministry, he, he faces profound personal griefs. His wife, Catherine, dies of smallpox. Only two years after their marriage and during childbirth at the age of 25, Matthew names his little baby girl who survives Catherine after his wife. And the late 1680s are a time of turbulent political change as well. James II, 
Uh, the new King of England on the death of Charles II has, has been relaxing some of the persecution, but with the goal of trying to really allow for a revived Roman Catholicism in England. And, and all of those things play out in the turbulence to uh, bring about the English Parliament calling on William and Mary to come, the, what we call the Glorious or Bloodless Revolution. And suddenly, um, by 1690, uh, freedom for public worship for Presbyterians like Matthew Henry and other groups of dissenters having English Puritan roots uh, is established. Well, that summer, uh, through connections made by his uh, wife, who, whose family, his wife who died, Catherine, her parents, uh, Henry is brought into contact with a godly young woman named Mary, Mary Warburton. And they get married, and together they have one son and eight daughters. They have a sweet and happy marriage and family life, though also marked by deep grief. They lose three of their children in infancy. Well, during these years of ministry in the city of Chester, Matthew Henry pursues a model of preaching, a consecutive exposition through books of the Bibles, really following the pattern of the Reformers. Um, and he's somewhat more expository in his approach than uh, widely so than some of the English Puritans of the previous generation who tended to focus uh, much more narrowly on a specific phrase or verse. Uh, Henry uh, ranges more broadly through the text consecutively. His preaching uh, reflects humility, wonder, and passion for the whole counsel of Scripture, delight and joy in the Word of Christ his Savior, and an eagerness to bring the whole counsel of the word to feed Christ's sheep, amusing on the heart of God reflected in his word of salvation. Matthew Henry said this, love is the golden thread that runs through the whole gospel. God's love to us, ours to him, and one to another. Well, by the early 1700s, Matthew Henry's now in his early 40s, and he's working on his Bible commentary. Uh, he draws uh, from his sermons and his study notes to do so. He largely completes this by the time of his death in 1714, and it's friends in ministry uh, who gather up his manuscripts and work with them to finish off the commentary work. And so uh, he remains ministering in the congregation in Chester, uh, till the age of about 50 in the year 1712. He's in deteriorating health. He takes a call to a new congregation in the city of London. And uh, landing in London, where does he start preaching in his new church? Genesis 1 and Matthew 1. Again, we see the, the love for the whole of scriptures, Matthew Henry's intention to start preaching through the word again in this new congregation. Well, he quickly settles into a routine of pastoral ministry, shepherding, and care for the congregation. He also makes some trips back to Chester. And on one of these, he falls from his horse and uh, dies the day after uh, this fall uh, due to his injuries. Well, a quick look just as we wrap up at Matthew Henry's writings. Well, I've mentioned a couple times the commentary on the whole Bible. Undoubtedly, this is the best known of Matthew Henry's writings. And it appears, if you look at the records, that it's, it's been steadily in print from its first pub publication. And uh, through the 1800s and to the present day, it's often been reprinted annually. Well, why has this been such a popular and enduringly helpful commentary. I think there's several reasons. First, Matthew Henry, much like John Calvin, wrote his commentary succinctly and clearly to the point. He made it understandable for the ordinary man or woman. Secondly, his commentary is exegetical and expository. He doesn't dive into all of the details of the grammar of the text, but his commentary shows significant careful understanding of the text. So reading his commentary leaves the reader with a, a good general understanding of text in its context. And then thirdly, his commentary is applied. He applies it to the heart. 
sometimes it's just innate application, you could say, bringing us to worship God, uh, to delight in Him. Sometimes it's very pointed personal application in terms of our own lives and hearts. Uh, for instance, uh, where he talks about a God um, hardening Pharaoh's heart, the ten plagues, his commentary on, Egyptians, uh, and on the Egyptians in Exodus 10, their situation. He notes that God responds to Pharaoh's cry for mercy. And uh, Matthew Henry sees this as a pointer to the reality that God is a God who is ready to show mercy and forgive. And he, he concludes his commentary on those particular verses with just doxology worship. Oh, that this goodness of God might lead us all to repentance. Now, Matthew Henry's commentary certainly had a few weaker points as well, does have. It's not a perfect commentary. Occasionally, he tends to spiritualize or allegorize in ways that do depart from the text at hand. Uh, but, of course, uh, we do see in the main, even in those cases, that he does uh, hold within um, the parameters, or you could say the rule of faith of sound doctrine, uh, even if it doesn't arise immediately from the text at hand, what he's looking at. A few of his other works that we just mentioned briefly here in closing. There's another series of works found in the complete works of Matthew Henry, which were published, been republished in the 20th century by Baker Books as a two-volume set, uh, some of which have been published separately. And among those are Henry's uh, work on prayer. It's been uh, written or republished as a method for prayer, and by Christian Focus, with an excellent foreword by Ligon Duncan. And the Banner of Truth Trust has also republished uh, work by Matthew Henry on prayer under the title A Way to Pray, uh, a version edited by Palmer Robertson, a modern English uh, translation that makes it much more readable uh, for a modern reader. Well, to conclude our session, Matthew Henry stands as one of the great heirs of English Puritanism. One of the first generation, really, of post-Puritan English Presbyterian ministers. English Presbyterianism at this time was small, it was struggling. And yet in the midst of those small, struggling churches, God uh, used this ordinary, faithful man in an extraordinary way through his writing uh, that has blessed us and continues to bless us to the present day. In the time we have left tonight, um, I, I'd like to give you a little more detail on what we know about the life and ministry of Matthew Henry. Uh, and I, I want to include some additional observations about his parents, Philip and Catherine Henry. But I want to start even earlier than that and say just a little bit about Matthew Henry's grandfather. Matthew Henry's grandfather, John Henry, uh, was originally from Wales. And somehow he came to be in the service of King Charles I of England as keeper of the orchard at Whitehall. And Whitehall was the primary residence of the English monarchs during the 16th and 17th centuries. And he and his family lived on the grounds of the estate at Whitehall. Are we on again? Can you hear me okay? Okay. And John Henry's son, Philip, as a boy, used to play with the king's sons, who would later become King Charles II and King James II. And this would have been in the years leading up to and during the English Civil War, which would culminate with the defeat of the king's forces by the forces of parliament and the subsequent execution of King Charles I for treason in 1649. And it was sometime during these years that Philip Henry was converted. And he had difficulty pinning down the exact time of his conversion, uh, but he was confident of it by the time he was a teenager. And therefore, in his ministry, he never emphasized to others any real necessity of being able to know the exact time of their conversion, believing that for many it was just not possible to know. Uh, he used to say, the work of grace is better known by its effects than its causes. 
And what he meant by that was that the evidence of true conversion is a changed life observed over time. Um, and and he, would, he would emphasize that to his son. Uh, well, Philip Henry did attend Oxford University where he studied under the Puritan John Owen. And then after graduating, he, at age 22 in 1653, he moved to a town called Worthenbury, which is a small village in Northeast Wales near the English border. And he served there as a tutor for the sons of a prominent family uh, in that town. And he also preached at the church at Worthenbury. And then a few years later in 1658, he was formally appointed as the officiating minister of Worthenbury after having been ordained the year before. In 1660, uh, Philip married Catherine Matthews, and she was the daughter of a pretty well-to-do farmer in the neighboring town of Broad Oak, which was also in Wales. And Catherine's father and her brother uh, initially uh, discouraged her from marrying Philip Henry. Um, because even though they, they knew he was a preacher, they knew he was a scholar, they didn't really know where he came from. And to these objections, Catherine replied, true, but I know where he's going, and I should like to go with him. Well, they did get married, uh, and a year later, their first child, John, was born, that you heard about in the video, and sadly, he died at age six from the measles. Now, recall, uh, from your English history uh, that it was during the decade of the 1650s that the Puritan Oliver Cromwell, uh, who had been the victorious general over the parliamentary uh, forces uh, and defeated the uh, royalist forces in the Civil War, was ruling England and Scotland and Ireland as Lord Protector of the Commonwealth. And during this time, there was a significant amount of religious freedom and not just for the Puritans, but for others as well. In 1658, however, Oliver Cromwell died, and his son did succeed him as Lord Protector, but he was not nearly so capable as his father or so effective. And really, within a couple of years, the Puritan rule began to disintegrate, and it, and it kind of fizzled. And there, a new parliament uh, was installed, and this new parliament called on the son of Charles I to come back and resume the monarchy. And now initially, Philip Henry thought this was a good thing and he welcomed the return of the monarchy because his childhood playmate would become King Charles II. But his opinion would change. Uh, under Cromwell's rule, remember there had been a good deal of freedom of worship, but with the monarchy restored now, the new parliament began to reverse uh, the reforms made during the 1650s that had been so favorable to the Puritans. And this reversal culminated with the Act of Uniformity in 1662. As you heard in the video, under this law, every minister in the country was required to give public assent to the use of the Book of Common Prayer and to use it exclusively uh, in the worship in the church. Uh, and everyone who declined to conform uh, would automatically be put out of their church uh, and forced to vacate their vicarages, which belonged to the Church of England, the state church. And many of the Puritan-minded ministers felt that the church and the government had no right to impose on them anything that the Word of God did not. And so about 2,000 ministers refused to comply. And of that number, about 130 were in Wales, and Philip Henry was one of those. And so, like the others, he was dismissed from his church, from his job, uh, and from his home. Um, and this event, of course, is, is referred to as the Great Ejection. So, thankfully, it was in this same year, 1662, which was uh, a dark year for a lot of godly preachers and families in, uh, in that time that Philip Henry's second son was born, and that's, of course, Matthew Henry. Now, after Philip Henry's ejection from his position at Worthenbury, uh, 
he and his family were not really destitute like so many others were. Uh, the details aren't 100% clear, but it seems that they had a good deal of support from Catherine's uh, family, uh, from the estate of uh, uh, Broad Oak. And it's maybe she inherited part of the estate. It's not quite clear. But in any event, they relocated from Worthenbury to Catherine's family farmstead at Broad Oak Farm. And it was not very far away. And it was here that Matthew Henry was born prematurely in October uh, of 1662. And his four sisters would later be born at that same home. And so ejected now from his ministry, uh, Matthew Henry did continue to minister to his own family uh, and their connections. Uh, the Henry family uh, would go to worship in a small congregation uh, at Whitewell Chapel that was, they could walk to on Sunday mornings and afternoons, at least on the Sundays when there was a preacher there, which was usually twice a month. And following the, the evening sermon, Philip would then preach to his own family at his home. Uh, and he was often very dissatisfied with the sermons they heard from the visiting Anglican minister at the chapel. Uh, and he would write about this in his diary on occasion. He wrote once after a Sunday uh, service, two empty, frothy, flashy, unprofitable sermons. Lord pity preacher and hearers. You never get any comments like that, Pastor. I'm not. Well, when there was not a preacher uh, at Whitewell Chapel, they would just worship at home all day long. And uh, Philip would preach to his family, and he would preach to others who would come to the Henry home because they were hungry for the word of God, and they knew Philip Henry was preaching it. Well, as you heard in the video, Matthew Henry was often ill as a child, really his whole life. But he had an extraordinary mind. I think you would have to be to write all the things that he wrote. Um, he, he learned to read, taught by his father at the age of three. That's what we're told. Um, and it's been said that at that age, he could, he could not only read the Bible clearly, but he could, at least he had some level of understanding of what he was reading. Uh, and his father actually encouraged him to memorize the sermons that he heard preached and then write them out afterwards. And by the age of nine, Matthew was able to write in Latin, and he could read part of the Greek New Testament. As a child, he also displayed uh, a spiritual uh, hunger and a spirituality far beyond what you would think expect from a child. Uh, when he was nine years old, uh, he heard about a relative who was sick, and he wrote a letter to his father who was away traveling. Uh, and he said this in the letter. By this providence, we may see that sin is the worst of evils. For sickness came with sin. Christ is the chief good. Therefore, let us love him. Sin is the worst of evils. Therefore, let us hate that with a perfect hatred. I don't know about you, but my children at nine never wrote me a letter <laughs> like that. Remarkable uh, person. Well, Matthew Henry was drawn to ministry from childhood. Uh, he loved to uh, meet with and pray with the ministers who would visit the Henry home. Uh, Matthew's father, Philip, encouraged Matthew to hold meetings on Saturday afternoons with his sisters and lead them in praying and singing. And uh, his own conversion was evident by the time he was 10 or 11. You heard that in the video. And by the time he reached the end of his teenage years, he uh, was uh, settled in his desire to become a preacher. Um, and now as a nonconformist, as you heard, uh, he was not allowed to attend university at Oxford or Cambridge as his father had done. Uh, so Philip did make arrangements for him to be tutored in this um, uh, academy run by uh, Thomas Doolittle, a nonconformist Puritan uh, in London. Uh, and also, yes, he began studying law when he finished there in 1685. At the age of 22, he started his, his law studies. Now, the first time Matthew Henry preached a sermon was in 1686 in the town of Nantwich. Uh, 
and he was there at the invitation of his friend George Illich, uh, whom he had known uh, as a teenager uh, when George used to come from Nantwich to Broad Oak to hear Matthew's father preach. And that same summer of 1686, uh, Matthew was invited to preach several times at the home of a Mr. Anthony Henthorne in the city of Chester, which was about 20 miles or so north of Broad Oak Farm where his parents lived. And Chester is on the English side of the, uh, the border with Wales. Uh, and there were a number of nonconformist Presbyterian families in the city of Chester who met regularly at Mr. Henthorne's house for worship. And they loved Matthew Henry so much after he preached two or three times that they asked him to come and be their pastor. Uh, and he tentatively agreed to that uh, on the condition that he could go back to London and finish his last year uh, as, a, as a law student, uh, which he did. And he graduated in 1687. And you heard in the video that he was privately ordained uh, in uh, uh, London by the leading Presbyterian ministers there whom he knew. Uh, and, and that was done privately because of the strict laws against uh, the nonconformists that were still in effect. Well, after his graduation, after his uh, ordination, he began what would be a 25-year ministry uh, in Chester as pastor to this congregation of nonconformist families that were meeting at that time in Mr. Henthorne's house. Now, providentially, uh, it was in this same year, 1687, that King James II, who had, been, uh, who, who had become king upon the death of his brother, Charles II, and who was himself Catholic, uh, began to ease some of the restrictions against uh, the nonconformists. And he issued, uh, without the approval of Parliament, uh, which caused him much trouble later, uh, uh, a declaration of indulgence that allowed Catholics and Protestants to worship in their own homes. And so this proclamation uh, allowed Mr. Henthorne's underground house church to begin to function legally as a house church uh, and to install Matthew Henry as their pastor, and that's what they did. Well, two years later, in uh, 1689, uh, Parliament, wanting to avoid a Catholic dynasty, uh, invited William of Orange and his wife Mary, who was the daughter of James I, and both of whom were Protestant, uh, to come and become the king and the queen of England. And that was what was known as the Glorious Revolution. And following the Glorious Revolution, uh, Parliament passed what was known as the Toleration Act, which established uh, a greater degree of religious freedom. And under the Toleration Act, uh, the nonconformists were allowed to build meeting places for worship. And they were no longer restricted to just meeting in private homes. And so Matthew Henry obtained a license to build a meeting place for his congregation. Now, we should also understand that by the time the Toleration Act is passed, the Puritan movement really is in decline. Uh, the years since the monarchy had been restored had really taken a toll. Uh, many of the Puritan leaders had been jailed or were dead by now. Uh, and more importantly, they weren't really being replaced in the numbers that they were in the first part of the 17th century when hundreds of young men were being trained as Puritan pastors in Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, but that had ended, and so... By this time, the Puritan movement in England is winding down, and it's really lost its momentum. But Matthew Henry would be the exception to that. Well, a month after he arrived in Chester, uh, Matthew Henry married Catherine Hardware. Uh, and she was the daughter of a committed Puritan Christian family. And, and Catherine's father and brother were happy about seeing her, their seeing uh, Catherine marry uh, Matthew Henry, but her mother was not so sure. Uh, it's not that she didn't, she was opposed to Matthew in any way, but she knew he was a nonconformist preacher, and she knew how much they were disliked by many, uh, and she also knew that the recently granted liberties could easily be taken away, and life would be really 
challenging for her daughter. But she did have such a high regard for Matthew that she ultimately agreed to the marriage, and she was pleased about it. Um, and so much so that Mr. and Mrs. Hardware relocated to the city of Chester so they could be near their daughter and their son-in-law and come under the preaching of Matthew Henry, which they came to appreciate greatly. Now, it wasn't long, however, that uh, sorrow came uh, to the Henry house. Uh, and as you heard in the video, uh, when she was very uh, pregnant, uh, Catherine contracted smallpox, died very soon after the baby came at the age of 25. Uh, Matthew was devastated by this. Uh, it was his mother-in-law, though, Mrs. Hardware, who had originally opposed the marriage, who was the greatest comfort to him of all the people around him. Uh, and she would later say, uh, God, who knew how long my child had to live, brought her into Mr. Henry's family to prepare her for heaven. And uh, it was also a great comfort, of course, to Matthew that the little baby girl survived, and he named her Catherine after uh, his wife. Well, he continued his work as a pastor, and he maintained a close relationship to his in-laws, and it was Mrs. Hardware who came to him and said, you need to get married again. Uh, and uh, not only did she advise him to do that, but she took it upon herself to go find him a wife. <laughs> and she did. Uh, she recommended one of her own relatives, Mary Warburton, uh, of Hefferston Hall in the broader county of Cheshire. Not Chester, but Cheshire, uh, which is the county. Now, the Warburtons were a wealthy family, and they had an interesting uh, uh, history themselves with regard to the Puritan movement. In the years following the great ejection, Mary's grandfather, Peter Warburton, um, encouraged many of the nonconformist ministers who were in dire straits to come and live on the grounds of his estate where he could uh, support them. He had a tunnel made from the cellar of his house out into the woods where these men lived and so he could take them food and supplies. And, and also, when ice would be brought to Hefferston Hall's ice house uh, from Liverpool, uh, the Warburtons would fill the returning horse-drawn carriage with nonconformist preachers to take them back to Liverpool where they could sail for America, and they fueled the Puritan influence in America. Uh, and so... Matthew married Mary Warburton at the great house at Hefferston Hall in uh, July of 1690. And Matthew and Mary had an extremely loving relationship. You can see that in the things he writes in his diary. Uh, but their joy would be mixed with sorrow as well. Their first child, Elizabeth, died at a year old uh, after getting a cough and a fever. But within a year of that baby's death, uh, they had another daughter whom they named Mary, and this little baby girl died three weeks later. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was a very sorrowful time for them. And two days after the second baby's death, Matthew was back in the pulpit. And he preached on Sunday morning from the book of Job. And he preached on Sunday evening from Romans 5 in the passage about death in Adam and life in Christ. And he closed that sermon by asking the congregation to remember what children like his baby daughter Mary were taken from and what they were taken to. Uh, and, and at the end of that really sad year, uh, Matthew Henry wrote this in his diary. I have received many mercies the year that is past. I have been brought low and helped. My dear wife is spared. I am yet in the land of the living, though many have been taken away. But how little have I done for God? What will become of me I know not. I find little growth. If anything hath at any time affected me this year, it hath been some sweet desires of the glory which is yet to be revealed. I have often thought of it as that which would help me in my present day. Well. Matthew and Mary had a third daughter, Esther, born in 
September 1694, and she would be their first child to survive to adulthood. Another daughter, Anne, was born in 1697, and she died of measles the following year. And another very sad uh, event in Matthew Henry's life was the death of his father, Philip Henry, which was in 1696, when Philip Henry was 65 years old. Philip Henry preached to his congregation at Broad Oak on Sunday, and then on Tuesday he got really, really sick, and Matthew was summoned from Chester because it looked like he was going to die, uh, and he got to Broad Oak that evening in time to be there with his father when he died. But before he died, Philip Henry said this to Matthew, Son, the Lord bless you and grant that you may do worthily in your generation and be more serviceable to the church of God than I have been. And Matthew responded, Oh, sir, pray for me that I may but tread in your steps. And Philip continued that evening to pray uh, or quote scripture right up until the point of his death. And his very last words were part of 1 Corinthians 15, 55. O oh, death, where is thy? And then he was with the Lord. And the following Saturday, Matthew Henry preached to his father's congregation uh, at the funeral. And afterwards, Matthew would write in his diary, This should bring me nearer to God. And make me live more upon him who is the fountain of living waters. My dear father was a counselor to me. But Christ is the wonderful counselor. He was an intercessor for me. But Christ is an intercessor that lives forever. And is therefore able to save to the uttermost. Well, there would be more sorrow for the Henry family before the end of the century. Two of his sisters died in 1697. And two years later, his widowed brother-in-law also died, leaving four children orphans. And so Matthew and Mary adopted them into their family. And Matthew's one and only son, Philip, was born in 1700, followed by four more daughters, all of whom survived infancy. Sadly, later in his life, uh, Matthew's son, Philip, rejected his godly heritage. And after Matthew's death, his son Philip, who never married, went into politics. And he would later even have his grandfather's old meeting place at Broad Oak torn down. His grandfather, Philip, whom he was named for. Now, it's, I think it's very important for us to note, in all of these sorrowful, sorrowful events in Matthew Henry's life, there's never a hint of his complaining against God. But rather, it seems that on these occasions, he humbled himself before God. He examined his life. He confessed his own sins. And no doubt, his own experience with trials and suffering made him more effective uh, in ministering to other people. Uh, and there are references in his diary to many, many people who would come to Matthew Henry uh, for help and counsel with their various trials that they faced. Well, what was his ministry like? What did it look like in, in Chester? Uh, while he was there at Chester, uh, he would preach at actually many churches uh, in the county of Cheshire and also in, to many churches across the border in Wales. And during the week, he was always riding his horse from town to town, preaching in these villages. Uh, he said that he could never resist an invitation to preach the gospel. And... Of course, he was also diligent in his own home congregation there in Chester. He conducted several meetings during the week, in addition to preaching uh, two or three times on Sunday. There was a meeting for uh, younger Christians that he would uh, do. There was another meeting he would do for older, mature uh, Christians with a study and a meal, and, and they would discuss uh, uh, the Bible. And then on Saturdays, he would conduct meetings with the children and would teach them like he had done with his sisters growing up. And at the end of a series of lessons for these children, he would have a special service at which he would preach a sermon to the children. Uh, he also ministered uh, to the prison, which uh, was in Chester Castle, where his own father had been imprisoned uh, for his faith 
or once uh, for a period of three weeks. And his, his diary shows that he made many, many visits to the members of his congregation in their homes to minister to them and especially to pray with them. He would have entries prayed with Mrs. Gregg at this uh, time in her life, uh, today. And for people who were really, really sick, uh, there were many times he would go two or three times in the same day to, to visit with them. Well, a few years of this ministry uh, in, going on in Chester, the congregation began to grow. And they eventually did build their meeting place, and they later had to add a balcony. And uh, they, they got up to about 350. I, we heard 250 in the video. I've read other things that say 350, uh, but let's call it 300, which, interestingly, about the size of Parker Bible Church. Um, but Matthew's primary concern was never numbers. He wanted to see spiritual growth in the lives of the people under his care. And also after several years of ministry in Chester, he began to be very well known. And he began to receive many requests from other churches to come and be their pastor, particularly churches in and around London. He always rejected these calls. He said, I will never leave Chester until Chester leaves me. He also, at about this time, began to be known for the things he was writing. Uh, in the early 1700s, one of his most popular books that you heard talked about, A Method for Prayer, was, uh, is one that is probably next to his commentary, the most well-known today. And in that book, he, 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 pray, he, he writes lengthy prayers of praying the scriptures, but, but he does it in an in a outline format where he, he outlines the key elements that we need to include in our prayers. You're probably familiar with the acrostic acts uh, the letters of which stand for adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. I think, I don't know this, but from reading the book, I think that comes from Matthew Henry. Now, it was also at this time that he began working on his commentary in his spare time, if you can imagine they had any. And this is it. Um, it's very heavy. Um, and he actually began to work on this as a way to engage his mind in some God-honoring activity during his spare time. Uh, something that would honor the Lord. And it was his friends that encouraged him to have it published. And in 1710, by which time he had largely completed the Old Testament part of his commentary, he got a letter from one of the most prominent congregations in London, the Presbyterian congregation at Hackney. It was a little suburb of London at that time. It's in, it's in the city now because, of course, the growth of the city. But this letter was just informing him that they had unanimously chosen him to come and be their pastor. <laughs> um, so Now, of course, he turned them down, as he always did. But this church wouldn't take no for an answer. Uh, and it was other pastors, his best friends in the ministry, uh, who pressured him, really, really put pressure on him and insisted that he should accept this invitation because he had become so well known and his books, not just these, but the things he wrote was becoming such an influence in many churches that they wanted him to be nearer his publisher in London and able to minister to, to a broader audience. Um, well, he eventually reluctantly agreed to go, uh, but only with the provision that he could return to Chester once a year for several weeks to preach there. Um, and he did go to Hackney. He, he preached uh, there, uh, was the pastor there from 1712 until his death in 1714. Um, and he was just as busy in London as he had been in Chester. Uh, he preached or taught six or eight times a week uh, visited his congregation, and when he wasn't doing all of that, he was working on something that he was writing and trying to finish his commentary. And as you know, he had health challenges his whole life, and when he moved to London, it just got much worse. Um, but despite his health going downhill, he, he just wouldn't slow down. He would not limit his busy schedule. 
And he also kept his promise to go back to Chester for a few weeks and preach. Uh, and it was when he was coming back from that uh, uh, on horseback, as always, uh, on Monday, June the 21st, 1714, his horse stumbled, he fell, um, the people with him encouraged him to stop right here, let's get medical care, you're, you're not okay, uh, but he insisted he was all right, uh, and he had a preaching engagement that night at Nantwich, uh, and so he, he went on to Nantwich, uh, and he did preach there. His sister Sarah, who lived nearby, was in the congregation at Nantwich that night, and she noted that Matthew didn't seem himself. And his old friend from his teenage years, George Illage, who all those years ago had been the one to invite him to this same town, Nantwich, to preach his first sermon, was also in the congregation, and he would hear what would be Matthew Henry's last sermon. Well, after the service, they took Matthew immediately to the home of the local Presbyterian minister, and that night he got really, really sick, and he had a stroke, and he died the next morning, age 51. And the next day, when his sister Sarah came and, and viewed his body, uh, she commented, there was nothing of death to be seen in his face, but rather something of a smile. And that's the life of Matthew Henry. Now, regarding his works, uh, we're running out of time, but I'll just say a couple of things quickly. Um, his commentary got published after his death. Uh, he had completed the Old Testament part, the Gospels, and the book of Acts. Uh, what we have as his commentary for the rest of the New Testament was actually compiled by a group of nonconformist ministers who were his friends and was partly based on the notes that members of his congregation all those years had taken as he had preached. And this work has now been in print, as we heard, for 300 years. Uh, and it's been praised uh, by many great preachers. Uh, George Whitfield used it a lot. Uh, John Wesley, Charles Spurgeon, many others. Uh, there's a lot of famous quotes from it. I'll just mention uh, a, a couple. Um, maybe the best known quote from his commentary, many of you probably know this, when he's talking about the creation of Eve. In Genesis 2, Matthew Henry says, the woman was made of a rib out of the side of Adam, not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected, and near his heart to be beloved. And it's also been noted by many that Matthew Henry consistently points the reader to Christ throughout his commentary, even in the, throughout the Old Testament, and not just in the obvious places where there are clear allusions to Christ. One example of this uh, regards Numbers 3.12. That, that verse says, Behold, I have taken the Levites from among the people of Israel instead of every firstborn who opens the womb among the people of Israel. The Levites shall be mine. Commenting on the passage, Matthew Henry writes this, God took the tribe of Levi entire for his own in lieu of the firstborn. Note God's institutions put no hardships upon men in any of their just interests or reasonable affections. It was presumed that the Israelites would rather part with the Levites than with the firstborn. And therefore, God graciously ordered the exchange. And then he adds this, yet for us, he spared not his own son. Just lastly, I'll mention, there are examples in uh, the hymns of Charles Wesley uh, where we can see that uh, he would take words right out of Matthew Henry's commentary and turn them into poetry. Um, there's, a, there's one called, A Charge I Have to Keep, A God to Glorify. Those words are actually not Charles Wesley's. Those are Matthew Henry's words. Uh, and in just a moment... Uh, Pastor Michael is going to uh, lead us in singing that hymn. Those words come from Matthew Henry's comments on Leviticus 8.35, which is in that passage about the consecration of Aaron and his sons uh, for the priesthood. And here's what that verse says. At the entrance of the tent of meeting, you shall remain day and night for seven days. 
performing what the Lord has charged, so that you do not die, for so I have been commanded. And Matthew Henry writes this, We have, every one of us, a charge to keep, an eternal God to glorify, an immortal soul to provide for, needful duty to be done, our generation to serve, and it must be our daily care to keep this charge, for it is the charge of the Lord our Master who will shortly call us to an account about it, and it is our, at our utmost peril if we neglect it. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for men like your servant, Matthew Henry, that you have raised up through the history of your people to be examples to us of faithful service over a lifetime. And Father, we pray that we would be faithful to keep the charge you've given to us, that when we stand before you and give an account, we won't need to be ashamed. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.